Hi, yeah, thanks for that introduction. So um, as mentioned, I'm Allison Sullivan, and I'll jump right into kind of explaining what proofreading the proofreader, the benefits of unit tests for software models is all about with a starting observation that um, I hope everyone can agree with, which is that it's just really hard to write programs correctly, especially with the scale of programs in industry. Um, I know having taught algorithms that it's hard for people to write even just those simple, efficient algorithm design solutions. Then you go into the real world and you have millions of lines of code and it's interacting with all of these different other systems. And so it's just really hard to, especially in one go in the first pass, pass actually write that program correctly. A really uh, old solution to this is the idea of using software models to improve correctness, which would be using um, the mathematical logic you might have been introduced to a long time ago in a discrete math class to actually specify specifically what you expect your program to do. And we typically write these models of the design with the idea that if we can create one cohesive uh, view of the design, it can be easier for all the developers working on the software to actually write it correctly. And in recent years, there was a recent breakthrough in the software modeling community to start doing what we call scenario finding tool sets. So this is the idea where you actually execute the software model and as output, you get an entire collection of all of the different valid states your program can enter into. And so then you can take these valid states, which I have an example of a, just a simple singly linked list written here, and the discovered scenarios are found automatically by analyzing the model and they're presented to the user. And ideally, she would want to iterate over them and make sure that every single one is a valid singly linked list with no cycles. Now, the problem with this is, well, it's really hard to write software models themselves correctly. Like, yes, they provide this great oracle and those scenarios can be turned into test over our implementation. But if the starting model is incorrect, then, you know, we've just punted the problem to the model instead of having the problem in the implementation. And so my research looked into the idea of addressing model correctness the same way that we do for simple blocks of code, which was the idea of establishing a unit test for a software model. So for our singly linked list example, an idea of a unit test that we came up with was to basically allow the user to specify one of those expected scenarios that should be found when the model is executed. And to say, you know, I expect a list with one node and no links anywhere to be found as a valid list and also support the idea of saying, you know, if I then add a cycle to that list um, in this example here, it would be just a self loop on the node. I expect this to be prevented. Um, so it's a pretty simple idea of a unit test, but it brings in a way to kind of quickly spot check your model because um, when you're executing and generating these scenarios, it's true that you're getting the snapshots of valid states your program can enter, and that's really nice. But in practice, since this is a bounded but exhaustive search, it's very common to find hundreds of scenarios. And so when you're writing your model, it might be slightly incorrect. And that incorrectness could mean out of the 150 scenarios, two are incorrect. Or maybe you just slightly wrote something wrong and you actually produce 149 scenarios instead of 150. And you have to realize as you're enumerating, oh, I don't think I ever saw this one type of list and I expected to see it. So the unit tests um, give the developer a way to kind of have a lightweight Spock check of their software model. And it's a practice that makes it feel a lot more familiar, a bit in the way uh, closer to how you would develop code and do a quick unit test or, you know, especially on a complicated little method, making sure you covered your corner cases. Um, 
But the other benefit that we ended up finding with the unit test is that once we had the definition of a unit test, there were a whole bunch of like automated software testing practices we could now look to support for a software model. And what we discovered was that the execution environment and the fact that we're dealing with these formal logics actually made a lot of those testing practices easier to automate. And you got even more benefit because some of the hard problems for a language like Java or C++ are actually pretty simple to solve on a model. So to illustrate, I'm going to step over an example for mutation testing. So mutation testing is one of the research areas in software testing. And the idea is if I have an original program, I can actually intentionally mutate the program and introduce changes to it. And by doing that, um, I want to make sure that I have a test that is capable of detecting this change. So in this original, there's two different mutants on the screen here. So for the first mutant, if I have a test where X is zero and Y is one, I'll observe a difference in output. The original will produce zero as a result and the mutant will produce one. However, for mutant two, no input will distinguish it from the original program. It happened to be a logically equivalent change to the program. We call that a equivalent mutant, and it's a really hard problem to solve in these imperative programming languages. Um, you know, right now you have to do just kind of a manual analysis of something we call propagation um, to see if it's ever possible to actually influence the output. You do a whole bunch of analysis through the control flow to reach the conclusion, oh, this is an equivalent mutant. So the existence of those equivalent mutants really impacts the applicability of doing an automated mutation testing environment, even though it produces really strong tests, it just has that downside. However, in a software model, if we create a mutation, the modeling language itself allows us to ask, is there ever a situation in which these two formulas differ from each other. So we can actually just ask the language to check for equivalence. And if they're not equivalent, if they do differ, then we do have the support in these languages to actually generate that scenario that shows their difference in behavior. So we can automatically create this test that kills the mutant. And so we are actually able to solve these really hard problems to do mutation testing in other languages really, really simply in the modeling language, just leveraging the nature of its execution. We've gone on to do things like fault localization, trying to automatically figure out what part of the model is incorrect given some failing test and automated repair to then go on and correct that faulty location so that all tests pass. And we've encountered similar benefits where some of these hard problems are just easier. For instance, for repair, if you think about a Java statement, there's so many different valid forms that Java statement can take. The grammar is so open, but in a modeling language, the grammar is much more constrained. So our search space is smaller and it's easier to then do something in the realm of an exhaustive search that will really be able to explore a lot of repairs without having the problem of running for 24 plus hours just to try and create an automated patch. So that's kind of uh, the key idea of my research direction in general is um, this idea that software modeling uh, can have a lot of benefits but it has a lingering uh, reputation that it's hard to scale and it's hard to use. Research has heavily focused on addressing the scalability issue with real dividends. There's a lot of um, work coming out, getting cited, um, including Amazon citing some work with TLA Plus and SMT solvers about actually deploying these formal methods in the real world. But the ease of use problem still remains. 
And so my research group's focus has been the idea that unit testing and everything that that enables can help ease the adoption of software models. And it turns out that these techniques can be done in a really nice automated way because of the environment that we're working in. Um, and also just a takeaway that I had is if you happen to be working with a non-traditional language that might not have built-in unit test, I would consider investing in trying to come up with a structured unit testing environment. You might be surprised by all the further benefits and unique automation opportunities that exist given your unique execution environment. Fantastic. I particularly love this. It's very near and dear to my heart, this idea of unit testing and the value and how we can think about expanding that. I think it's especially interesting. Um, and I'm going to give, I'm going to ask my question to give a chance for any other questions to come into the, the Slack over here. Um, but when we're talking about unit testing in the context of software models, right, we're talking about an abstraction of a piece of software, which I think makes sense to be thinking about validation at that point. Have you thought about or have you done any work that gives any insights into the value beyond that, right? Like if I'm doing unit testing at my, of a software model level, does that buy me something when it comes time for implementation, when it comes time for maintenance, when it comes time for, for some of the t tasks that come later down the pipeline? Any insights you can share mm -hmm. or thoughts on that? Yeah, so there is definitely a whole body of work dedicated towards taking those scenarios um, that get produced and trying to figure out how to automate those into test over the implementation. But as mentioned, the fact that it's a bounded exhaustive search, um, oftentimes that runs quickly into um, scalability issues and maybe even a lot of redundant paths through your tests. And some of these scenarios are very similar, but slightly different. So there's a whole body of work dedicated to creating a more interesting subset of scenarios. And so we've looked into trying to map in the idea of coverage metrics to a model, and then you yeah. generate tests for that coverage. And then those scenarios, you would then translate into tests over the implementation, and it would be guided by model coverage. And then the goal is hoping that that leads to interesting coverage within the implementation. We haven't actually studied how well that last part connects in, but I think that that is definitely um, the next step is figuring out how to connect it better to the implementation. Fantastic. Uh, and so we do have one more question. I want to make sure we get squeezed in before we get to the next talk um, in the chat. We have a question from Greg that says, what's the best intro to this kind of modeling for a working programmer who never did or doesn't remember, uh, most of us, a discrete <laughs> math or formal methods course? Yeah, so um, the language I use in the slides is called Alloy, A-L-L-O-Y, um, and it um, has been kind of a focus in undergraduate courses that are looking to start introducing formal methods because it does, as output, automatically produce graphical scenarios. Some of the other scenario finders will produce text outputs of the scenarios, um, and so that's not as approachable. And there's recent work to create, um, that has created this website called Alloy for Fun. Um, and so Ooh. it is a website you can go to. It has Alloy installed and running in its backend and you just type in, it gives you prompts to fill in and then it has a backend Oracle it's checking you against. And so it'll show you examples of scenarios that you allowed that the Oracle didn't or vice versa to help mm. uh, correct you. So Alloy is something that has been used a bit more in the educational um, perspective. So I would say resources like that would be beneficial. <laughs> 